Welcome and everyone to panel number six of Generation Analog. Um, I'm Dr. Evan Torner at the University of Cincinnati, and we're going to hear from in turn, and we have changed the order, so listen closely, uh, Catherine Castillo-Jones from University of Cincinnati, uh, followed by uh, Finley Palaniki from Staffordshire University. Uh, then we'll hear from Melissa Kagan at Curry College, and then finally from P.S. Burge at uh, University of Central Florida. Um, this uh, the topic of this panel is uh, sexualities at play. Um, you know, ba based on you know the queerness in games conference and other major um, uh, watershed academic events in the last uh, decade, we can pretty much now equate uh, play as sex, or play and sexuality as being very, very closely related, and that queerness is also always along for the ride. So in these four topics, we're going to be, uh, you know, diversifying our notion of sex and sexuality in uh, play environments. Uh, I don't want to take too much longer on this topic. So I'm going to kick it already off to Catherine Castillo-Jones with uh, the presentation, What is Erotic About Erotic Games? Are you ready to go? Um, give me a sec. There we go, yes. All right, can everyone hear me? Okay, so my presentation today is what is erotic about erotic games. Um, and I am at um, the beginning of this research project. So I'm gonna be giving a lot more sort of background information um, about um, sort of the, the reasons that I'm interested in this research, um, sort of methods, a uh, little bit of a literature review. Um, because I don't yet have a lot of findings collected. All right, so I'm interested in studying sexy or erotic games. And what I mean by erotic games is not just games that um, include some sort of sexual content or that um, participants can uh, bring in sort of erotic content or make them sexy, um, but I'm specifically interested in looking at games that define themselves as erotic or sexy games. Um, why am I interested in studying this? Well, in addition to being a... Oh. Apologies, Kat. Um, just put this slide back up. No problem. So in addition to being a game studies scholar, I'm also a sociologist. Um, and my main interest uh, of study in sociology is sexuality. Um, so I'm interested in putting these two fields in dialogue with each other, um, expanding the understandings of sexuality in game studies, um, which there, there are people that study sexuality in games, um, but definitely could use more uh, research in this area. And also putting this sort of in dialogue with uh, critical sexuality studies coming out of sociology, which takes um, sexuality as socially constructed and is interested in sort of meaning making and um, the social nature of sexuality. And so games to me are a really interesting site um, as sites for meaning making around sex, sexuality and erotic, again, particularly these games which define themselves as sexy or erotic games. Um, studies of sexy games um, have tended to sort of create a taxonomy. This um, taxonomy comes from Ashley Brown's 2015 uh, Analog Game Studies article on the taxonomy of sexy games. Um, where she creates these categories of sexy brink play, sexy board and card games, secret dress up and erotic role play, which Brown and Stenros further define in a 2018 chapter um, as role play, which invokes erotic, sensual and sexual themes. And their understanding of erotic role play allows for participant focused um, role play as well as um, 
designer defined erotic role play. There we go. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about the distinction between sort of these um, other forms of sexy games, the sexy brink play, sexy board and card games from erotic role play, which is what's going to be the focus of my study. Um, so an example of both sexy brink play and sexy board and card games is the adult late night games published by Lagoon Games, um, which has 21 of these so-called late night uh, games. And if you look at some of the text from the back of the game package, you get a sense of how this game uh, package of games is constructing sex and sexuality, right? So Brown talks about sexy brink play as being um, play that creates a sort of flirty party atmosphere. Um, activities that would normally be taboo, um, for instance, playing Twister, um, are given this sort of magic circle um, alibi to be able to engage in these kinds of activities, right? Um, so you see this party atmosphere described in these late night games. They're suited to late night revelers who don't want the party to end. Inhibitions are starting to slip. Um, and you also get, again, this emphasis on sexuality as being sort of after dark and adult content, right? Um, no one would dream of playing these games in the clear light of day, um, but when you need to let your hair down, you can bust out these late night party games. And they have very cheeky titles like Girls on Top, Peep Show, Pucker, and Suck. Um, so these adult late night party games take the sexy brink play and sort of package them within a sexy card game that adults can play um, when they need an excuse to um, engage in these sort of otherwise taboo activities. When we get into erotic role play, one of the differences is that it is the characters who are engaging in this erotic content and sexual activity as opposed to the players. So when you're playing a game of Twister, um, it's the players that are engaging in this otherwise taboo activity. Um, when you're playing these late night party games, it's the players who are engaging in these sort of taboo activities of sitting on people's laps. Um, but when you engage in erotic role play, suddenly you have characters who are engaging in various forms of erotic play, not just the players. One of the sort of famous slash infamous examples of erotic role play is the book of erotic fantasy. Um, the book of erotic fantasy is for use, um, particularly with games like Dungeons and Dragons. Um, and one of the things I find so interesting about the book of erotic fantasy um, is the way that it engages with erotic content on sort of multiple levels within the book. So it's a 192 page full color book that promises to address issues of sex, love, seduction, marriage, and pregnancy. Um, one of the things that's very interesting about the book of erotic fantasy is its focus on particularly procreative sex and marriage, um, as well as sort of the outcomes of uh, intercourse such as pregnancy, such as childbirth, such as sexually transmitted infections. Um, it's very much interested in sort of mechanical effects of erotic content. Um, it promises 20 new feats, three new classes, 75 new spells, 12 new monsters, and variant rules. And we see here some of the, the images of two ways that erotic content is thematized. Um, one is through these erotic images, which caused a lot of sort of controversy when the book was released. Um, because they feature photos, very sexy sort of titillating photos of real people, often photoshopped or in sort of fantasy garb. Um, along with, we have a uh, table two through four, which is a table on interspecies crossbreeding. Um, 
So again, a lot of focus on how to integrate this content mechanically in the games, while also recognizing sort of the erotic um, titillating potential of this content as well. And again, this promises to add new dimensions, courtly intrigue and manipulation, marriage of power and prophesized birth, dangerous seducers and sex magic. Book of Erotic Fantasy has a very particular way of dealing with sex and sexuality. Um, if we looked through this and analyze it, we could see the discourse that this book is using, um, the way that it's constructing sexuality, the meanings that it's bringing to sexuality. Another example, and the example that I'm gonna focus on for the rest of this paper is a collection called Honey and Hot Wax. And Honey and Hot Wax is also a book um, of erotic role-playing games, but it's one that calls into question the meanings that we bring to sex and engages in sort of this meaning-making within the games themselves. So for example, this text from the back of the book that was also used in promotional materials about the collection starts with the phrase, sex is. And then it goes on to examine the different things that sex is. Is sex exploring your partner's body? Is it experimenting at a BDSM party? Is it a gossip topic? Is it masturbating with balloons? Is it almost everything you do? Um, and you get the gamut of different things that sex can be that sex can mean. Honey and Hot Wax is an anthology of erotic art games. It contains eight games, a foreword by Naomi Clark, a chapter on safety and consent by Maury Brown, and the editors of the anthology, Sharon Biswas and Lucian Khan, both contributed a game to the anthology. Uh, the collection was made possible in part um, by a grant from the Effing Foundation for Sex Positivity, um, and had a particularly interesting for me, um, looking at sort of meanings around sex, call for submissions, right? So one of the things that I'm interested in, in terms of Honey and Hot Wax is that it's analog games, right? Um, a lot of digital games have received attention for sexual content um, as erotic games, right? There has been less attention paid to analog games. So these are analog games that can be played wholly from the text. Um, importantly, Honey and Hot Wax is completely a uh, PDF. There is not a sort of hard physical copy of the book in print. Um, another thing that was very interesting to me about Honey and Hot Wax was that they wanted playable games, right? That these were explicitly erotic games that were meant to be playable and not exclusively conceptual. And because I'm interested in putting in dialogue game studies and critical sexuality studies, I was particularly interested in games that were meant to be played. Um, all the games needed to either focus on one aspect of sexuality as a central theme, not merely as peripheral flavor, or involve the explicit use of sex acts as game mechanics, and not merely a byproduct of playing the game. Again, I find this very interesting because previous literature has looked at games with sexual content and mechanics used to simulate sex acts within a game, um, but there has not been as much attention paid to using sex acts as the game mechanics themselves. Um, the final thing from the call for submissions, which is important, is that the editors decided not to explicitly define the term sex and sexuality and instead take a broad view of the term, right? Um, they did include some text from the Effing Foundation about sex positivity, which was very broad in terms of understanding sex positivity to include demisexuality and asexuality within this understanding of sex positivity um, rather than a very narrow definition of sex and sexuality. So what do I intend to do in my study of honey and hot wax? 
Um, again, I'm interested in studying honey and hot wax because it's self-defined and selected erotic games. Um, these are games that are not participant defined as erotic, um, but that both the designers and the editors um, classified them as erotic games. Uh, with nine authors and eight games, I have this very nice bounded sample for study. And because the call for submissions was so expansive in its definition of sex and sexuality, it allows for an exploration of meaning and helps expose the socially constructed nature of sex and the erotic. I want to sort of highlight that these games um, are quite diverse in the ways in which they deal with sex and sexuality. Um, some of the games don't include characters performing sex acts. They're about communication, they're about talking about desire, they're about exploring sexuality, um, but nobody's actually having sex while you're playing the game. Um, on the sort of other end of the spectrum, you have games uh, in which the mechanics are sex acts. Um, so the players are, may, might be performing sex acts, but the characters might not actually be having sex within the game. Um, another interesting point about studying Honey and Hot Wax is that it features games from outside the Nordic LARP tradition. So Nordic LARP is a design tradition which um, includes uh, a lot of mechanics for simulating sex. There's been a lot of um, attention paid to uh, games that have as central themes sex and sexuality within the Nordic LARP tradition. So I'm, I was curious to explore these erotic games, which don't come all from the Nordic LARP tradition, but from actually a pretty wide variety of different um, design and play traditions. The method that I'll be using is content analysis of the game text. And I'll be drawing on this idea of literary ludic analysis, which focuses both on the content and language, but also on the mechanics, right? So analyzing these as sort of literary texts, but also as games um, and how sort of the mechanics and the play um, also have uh, meaning making and construction of sexuality and the erotic. And what I'm hoping to do as a follow-up project as well is to do a content analysis of reviews of the collection so that I can put into dialogue sort of how the designers and editors saw the games versus how people in, in sort of game communities, um, players themselves view the games. And I am at time. So if you do have any questions, maybe I can advance my screen, there we go. Um, please feel free to contact me. Again, I'm uh, Dr. Katherine Castillo Jones at the University of Cincinnati. And here is my email up here. I don't have Twitter, so sorry. <laughs> um, but I would love to hear from you and talk more about this project. Thank you very much. And also always for sticking with time. And our next uh, presentation, again, different from the program. Well, actually, uh, Aaron asked to, for me to, um, I, to. Evan, I think we can go on with PS. Actually. Right. Okay. You, you've got it. All right. Yeah, then let, let them try to share their screen um, and play okay. the video briefly. Okay. So, so, so PS, you're going to be next, but we're going to see uh, if your video plays with audio. So, and you are muted. Sorry, I double mute myself because I'm paranoid. Um, it is giving me the share sound option. So you want me to present now or just test to clarify? I'd love for you to present now. Just yeah, uh, uh, just that because that that mechanical issue okay. is now solved. No, yeah. no, no, perfect. In that case, um, give me a second, and then. Let me quickly configure everything. And then just yell at me if you cannot hear um, everything. The paladin raised his torch and looked around the room. Sorry. You see a fountain. The DM began, pausing to check the module. Three marble maidens stand in the fountain, holding pitchers out of which water flows. My rogue stepped forward. Hang on, let me try some mage hand, I said. 
I cut to the water, poked the fountain with a spear, but eventually the paladin cut me off. Enough, I'll drink the water, he said. The DM nodded, suppressing a smile. All right. He rolled a die off screen and paused. You, um... He said, suddenly stumbling. Your character is a man, right? The paladin's player looked concerned. Yes, she said skeptically. His, um, his sex changes, so he, er, um, she... The DM looked uncomfortable. Everyone looked uncomfortable. And there was a long pause. Okay. Hi, nerds. Thanks for being here. I'm V.S. Berge, and this is going to be my talk, The Table and the Tomb, Positioning Trans Power and Play in Dungeons and Dragons. Um, now, before we delve, I want to cast a quick message cantrip. Tabletop games are crucial sites of exploration and friendship for queer and trans people, D&D included. And I want to be clear that my arguments here are never meant to diminish the joy of trans players who continue to thrive in, hack, and reimagine games hostile to our presence. So to my trans friends and colleagues out there rolling dice and kissing pirate queens, you're perfect, carry on. But with that said, let's get into it. As other scholars have noted, we have yet to fully contend with D&D's conservative legacy and rocky relationship with gender. I opened this talk with an anecdote from the last D&D campaign I ever played, where my party confronted a cursed fountain in the 2017 module Tomb of Annihilation, which Mark Hines talked about yesterday. And this moment is a glimpse of the transphobic logics at work in D&D, which include traps that quote quote, reverse a character's biological sex. And these have been around since the 70s. The roots here run deep. So in this talk, I contend with these transphobic logics perpetuated by the self-described world's greatest role-playing game. Drawing from game texts and social media data from reactionary D&D stands, I argue that D&D's hostility to trans play is coded deeper than any single narrative or mechanical system. Instead, it is inscribed in the game's promise of fantasy realism, which is used to exclude trans bodies, vilify trans stories, and diminish trans power. To show this, I will describe how D&D is ultimately a game about simulating and enforcing the bounds of fantasy realism. We'll then discuss how these boundaries are used to validate specific kinds of embodied power. And finally, I will argue that trans characters, bodies, and stories have their power mechanically curbed and narratively contested in order to reset center cisnormative power fantasies. So first, let's talk about D&D's roots in fantasy realism and what this inherently oxymoronic term actually means. D&D historian John Peterson points out that early war games were preoccupied with realism and simulation. And Michael Corns wrote in 1966 that there is only one rule to our war game, simulate reality. And yet while Gary Gygax argued in 1979 that D&D was entirely uninterested in realism or simulation, Peterson notes that D&D did not not abandon the old school promise to simulate reality, but instead strove for a system that represented magic and monsters in a balanced way, preserving the logic of the fantasy literature that these systems emulated. And we can call this fantasy realism, the common sense that governs D&D's design and at the table execution. And this is coded into the game's lore, and it shapes how monsters, game physics, and even style guides for D&D are designed. But fantasy realism is also rooted in hegemony, and in 2020, we got to see this firsthand. Outraged by Wizards of the Coast's public commitments to increase diversity, reactionary D&D fans on Twitter and YouTube rallied around a far-right dog whistle, hashtag keep gaming fantasy. And fascinatingly, reactionary D&D stands rallied to fantasy as the point of opposition to the quote unquote political. As one hashtag user wrote, race, social class, sexual orientation, politics has never mattered the moment your butt hits the seat. And so if the political means the multifold identities of trans, queer, and non-white people, then to hashtag keep gaming fantasy is to bound gaming to exclude these identities. 
As Misha Cardenas points out, though, the bodies and lives of trans people of color can feel unimaginable in societies whose common sense imagines they do not exist. And so this is the central provocation of this article. If D&D is meant to simulate fantasy realism, we must first ask whose fantasy, whose reality? So now I'm going to show you how the boundaries of fantasy realism are used to validate specific kinds of embodied power. Mechanically, power in D&D is defined by a character's ability to move through and manipulate the world around them. And Shelley Jones notes the Darwinian nature of this power fantasy in which superheroic characters are motivated to go from low-level nobodies to demigods, becoming ever stronger, faster, and better. And this is further evidenced by the power gaming subculture within the fandom. Sites like tabletopbuilds.com feature pages of build guides specifying the optimal features needed to give characters in-game power. But what happens when players do not want to re-articulate these same power fantasies? For example, Sarah Thompson's third-party supplement for D&D 5e, The Combat Wheelchair, published in 2020, was considered a breakthrough in representation for disabled characters in D&D, yet it received backlash from reactionary fans online. And these posts generally fell into two camps. Some fans claimed the chair was overpowered. As one user wrote, I'm not just going to give my players these magic tank-like wheelchairs with no penalties right off the bat. If they want to play that way, they earn it like everyone else at the table. Literally makes the player more powerful than their able-bodied counterparts. Totally not broken. I'm not stating opinions. I'm stating the reality of the world. But the second camp argued the opposite. As one 4chan user wrote, healing magic exists in D&D and is generally available to the players. So any disabled character should be able to just get a cleric to heal their legs. My question is, how is it that fans can cite reality as a reason for dismissing a mobility aid in a game full of plane shifting lich kings, astral fortresses, and clock angels? The backlash to the combat wheelchair shows how players draw the lines at the borders of fantasy realism to exclude disabled bodies. And as Michael Stokes writes, for diverse identities to be implemented in Dungeons and Dragons, they must be both part of the cultural conversation about the game and desirable. And reading these posts, I am reminded of ongoing conversation about trans bodies in other spheres of play, particularly trans athletes who are at once described as over and underpowered, unbalanced, reduced to statistics or talking points about anabolic agents, bone structures, and organ sizes. And to be clear, I'm not suggesting that disabled and trans bodies are equivalent, but rather that fantasy realism serves as the shifting lines drawn to exclude non-normative bodies. And this is the second provocation. After asking whose fantasies are being centered, we must also ask, how these fantasies are used to validate and shape embodied power. When we try to position transness within these logics of fantasy realism, we find that it is mechanically curbed and narratively contested in order to recenter cis-normative power fantasies. D&D is a game full of transformational magic and shape-changing creatures, and the potential for characters to reimagine and remake their bodies to transform or operationally shift, as Cardenas writes, opens space for trans stories. But to fit such power into the logics of fantasy realism, D&D only gives us two bad options. One is to disempower transness and make it flavor. As lead rules designer Jeremy Crawford says, you can make any character gender fluid. No rules are associated with gender. Clarifying D&D's neoliberal approach where any character can simply be trans without altering the mechanical elements of the game, at least until they happen upon a sex swap curse. But the second option is to embrace transness as power, but limit it. And we see this in the game's transformational spells. The power to alter one's own body comes with increasing layers of restrictions, limitations, and caveats. 
the game's fantasy races that can alter their forms are likewise mechanically curbed. Changelings can shapeshift and are described as having a fluid relationship to gender, yet there's a host of limitations to their transformations, including the fact that they are reverted to a true form when they are killed. Doppelgangers likewise share these limitations and are vilified with gross stereotypes such as assuming attractive male forms to seduce women, leaving them to raise their progeny. Yet what's funny is that 5e has been celebrated because of its assurances that genderqueer play is possible. In fact, both the 5th edition player's handbook and lead designer point to the elf god Corallon and the blessed elves as examples of canonically gender fluid beings in the D&D universe. Well, Jeremy, you want me to talk about the elves? Fine. You've got me talking about the elves, because there is actually no better example of how fantasy realism curbs trans power than wizard's own trans poster child, Corallon Lorethian, pictured here. In Mordenkainen's Tome of Foes, we learn that Corallon is capable of adopting many appearances, male, female, or something else, and is described as having a flamboyant, mercurial personality, but also being overpassionate and deceitful. And according to the lore, Corallon's mutability infuriates the orc god Groomsh, who declares a war on Corallon, and, in fact, the first elves in D&D emerge from the blood that Corallon sheds during the transphobia wars. And these elves are just as troubling. The primal elves in D&D were able to change their sex at will, but were, I shit you not, deceived by the spider queen Lolf into giving up this power and were punished with static forms and cut off from Corallon's wild, ever-shifting ways. But don't worry, there are occasionally born elves so androgynous that they are blessed by Corallon and can change their sex, but only once per day and only if your DM says it's okay. And by the way, dark elves hate this power because in case you haven't noticed where trans power does exist in D&D, it is only enabled through the plasticity of whiteness. And somehow these are the examples that I'm supposed to be fucking celebrating? To bring trans power <laughs> into D&D systems is to accept a reductive compromise, setting awkward and disturbing mechanical limits on trans power in the name of balance, while centering hostility, violence, and shame to make transness some kind of obstacle for narrative growth. Okay, it's time to wrap up. D&D remains fundamentally incompatible with trans play. Despite its recent pushes towards diversity and the increasing numbers of queer characters in its adventures, D&D's focus on fantasy realism and its enforcement of a rigid power fantasy means that trans power and trans play must be either defanged as flavor, turned into limited temporary powers, or made to recenter cis normative fantasies. So, how might we position transness in D&D in a way that centers trans fantasies, realities, and power? There are two options. The first is, we don't. As I have written about and will keep writing about, there are so many games out there by queer and trans designers that do not share this baggage. And online and in indie and zine spaces, we are seeing games that push the very limits of trans play and storytelling. But the second option is to keep the provocations I've laid out here in mind and remember that incremental representational improvements and the work of individual GMs hacking their games is not going to fix this. This is an issue embedded into the very core logics of fantasy at the heart of Dungeons and Dragons. And this is the final provocation. We cannot continue to squeeze trans power into cis normative structures meant to diminish trans stories. Instead, when we see the borders of fantasy realism drawn to exclude us, we might loudly say, fuck this fantasy, fuck your reality, roll for initiative. Okay, that was kind of an intense note to end on. Thank you all for listening. Here's my info if you would like. I am chronically online, always on Discord. Would love to chat about these things. Thank you so much, P.S. That was a gift, really. <laughs> I did just I, I, every aspect of it. Um, and I, as a footnote, as someone who studies film, you know, Hollywood is far gayer and more trans than anyone, you know, uh, in the industry. 
at the top would uh, you know acknowledge it but then to, to to bring that in is somehow political and and i think it's the same with the dnd audience that the dnd audience is way queerer and way more trans than than anybody uh you know at 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 um the organs of power would, would would care to admit and and i think that that's a it's a powerful social force to mobilize but we, we can talk more about that in q a and Perfect. our Thank our you. next uh, yeah i just uh, yeah i'm just, uh, really taken by your talk um i will say um our next presenter is uh finley palaniki from staffordshire university um, giving a talk called Queer There Be Monsters, a practice-based research project on queer games design and application to solo analog gaming and failure. So I'll let him uh, set up his slides. Yeah, give me a second. There we right. go. I think that works. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm Finley Palaniki. I'm going to just start this real quick by saying I'm really nervous. This is the first time I've done something like this and what I'm going to share with you is a condensed version of like a partial fulfillment for my bachelor's in game studies. Um, I'll throw my Twitter and email address up again at the end, but yeah, this is Queer There Be Monsters. I'm not going to say the full name again. <laughs> um, so yeah, as an overview, this was my partial fulfillment for my bachelor's degree. So we had to do like a self-led project. So I split it into two parts, obviously the written essay. And I wanted to make a solo journaling role-playing game that encapsulated and meant queerness to me. And by doing so, I also set forth kind of the ideas of investigating queer theory and design practices in application to solo analog gaming. And trying to understand what it means to be a queer games designer, which I hadn't considered myself until I finished this project. So as a quick overview, I wanted to make specifically a solo journaling game, which I personally defined as a form of experimental gameplay that focuses on a single player experience. Uh, the method of playing is through journaling, adapting what is often marked as like a meditative practice into a creative outlet for role-playing purposes. These games are often really accessible, mostly like in designs and like PDFs, I adore them. Um, you usually only need like a set of cards and a D6 and obviously pen and paper and you're gone. You, you can go off and do this. And again, it's creative journaling, which I find very meditative. And there's been a lot of studies that kind of show that this is a really good kind of creative way of working through various issues. Um, a couple of my favorites on the side there are the Wretched. Um, this one is really intense. <laughs> These two games really uh, conflict each other. So the Wretched is a really intense game kind of based off of Alien. You are the last survivor of a mass alien attack on your spaceship. And the Wretched uses a specific system that also incorporates like a tumbling tower akin to Jenga. And it implements this level of stress. The more blocks you lose by blundering or you know, wasting time, the shorter your game gets. And you can play without this, but I think it's a really nice way to kind of work through some less than savory emotions. Like if you're feeling stressed, putting yourself in an imaginary stressful situation kind of helps. Uh, on the flip side, Apothecaria by Anna Blackwell, you just pretend to be a village witch and you gather ingredients to make potions to help everyone else in the village. And it's really sweet. It's a really comforting and like really aesthetically pleasing uh, experience where it kind of encourages you to get like all your floral stickers and your washi tapes out. And I really recommend it. <laughs> um, so how was I going about making my project queer? Uh, so these are kind of the main pillars of which my research was based on, structural queerness and empowering queer narratives. I was really into this and kind of deep diving deeper into this to apply it to analog gaming. I'll go into a little bit later. Uh, the Gothic Monster to Crypto's research pipeline. This is gonna be mostly about cryptids when I get there. And simply because I'm queer and what that means to me in like a social kind of way in relation to this project, it's a massive part of my identity. And I wanted to 
kind of have this closeness with my project and obviously eventually be able to share it in some sort of way. <laughs> uh, so the kind of ways I facilitated my queer methods kind of came from looking from the ground up. So obviously trying to find a pl plausible methodology. So my specific practice-based research was based on game sketching by Emma Westcott. And it really <laughs> essentially let me be really scatterbrained with this project. It let me work from the ideas of the game first as opposed to the research. It let me construct the idea of play and how I wanted to make my play queer and how I wanted to structure that queerness as Avery Alda kind of does with her games. And as opposed to a deck of cards or rolling dice with solo journal and games, I wanted to bring forth a different method so I decided to really from the beginning work with a paper fortune teller to help with the uh, play of my solo journal and game, which I thought was kind of fun. It's a childhood kind of memory and it adds a level of physicality that I really think incorporates you as a player into the situation. And obviously facilitating my queer methods is accepting that Societally, being queer is failure, as Halberstam said in multiple, multiple writings. And reading all about this was really important for me <laughs> um, and kind of allowing me to accept that as long as I create something that is that I consider queer and that is considerably art, it's OK if it's a little bit handmade. <laughs> uh, so the next bit, major piece of research is cryptids are gay. If you don't really know what a cryptid is, uh, Oxford Languages defines it as an animal whose existence or survival is disputed or un unsubstained, such as the Yeti. Other examples I've put on the slides are Mothman, the Sasquatch, the Loch Ness Monster, and the Jackalope. Um, I personally argue that cryptids are the modern kind of 2010 successors to the classic Gothic monster, which has been included in a number of writings by Susan Stryker and Jack Halstern about like how you reflect your personal queerness and transness and how we can mirror these creatures that are highly deba debated upon and otherwise excluded. Um, also with this kind of research into kind of monstrous queerness, personally, this is a strong statement of like reclamation for me. Um, kind of finding that there is no way to separate any of my identities, whether it be my race or my class and my queerness. They're all one package deal and they're all viewed the same. And I look to cryptids. These are my Frankenstein. This is my vampire. People try and categorize them in a zoological sense as if it's necessary to try and, you know, categorize this rabbit with antlers or this giant moth-like creature. It's no like people that don't understand it don't need to. And I think that's how I feel about my personal identity. I just want to be and I want to exist. And I think this is the my segue. This is my uh, piece de resistance. I really love cryptids. So my game <laughs> that this research all led on to uh, is called Welcome to Brightbrook, Queer the Beyonsters. Uh, it's a role playing game about making a cryptid and being a cryptid. Um, you're kind of, you're introduced as a cryptid who's new in town and you have to converse with people eventually. You can't live in complete isolation. That's really sad. And you find yourself noting down these conversations as they are few and far between. And really it's a game about the conversations you make with people. Um, and kind of acknowledging that as a cryptid, wink, uh, you're never quite having the same conversation with other people. <laughs> but it's interesting to log these things. Uh, so kind of general inspirations, kind of the idea of most of the locations I consider to be liminal spaces. So in between realities, in between like one place and another, I'm going to hurry up as fast as I can, I'm sorry. Um, kind of sci-fi and alternate realities, um, designing a cryptid and talking to people. That's my chatterbox and these are the rounds that you go through. Um, I just wanted these words to spark inspiration, essentially. Um, 
and kind of develop a weirder narrative as you take turns with a random uh, NPC uh, versus what you would um, consume, like either of these, any of these generated responses as. Um, so it's to make this kind of dichotomy of we're having two very different conversations depending on how you register it. Um, I guess I'm a queer games designer now. I designed a prototype for a game and I'm queer. Really simple, but it's not, that's it. I did it. Um, it was only a prototype, it's semi-functional, but there's an emotional success here and some societal failure and shenanigans. And I can do some more research into this, which is neat. Um, so that's a whirlwind tour of queer baby monsters. <laughs> Again, I'm sorry. Um, but there's the itch.io link. I'll put it on my Twitter later tonight and my email address if you want to talk to me about cryptids. <laughs> Thank you, Finley. That was that was great. <laughs> and I think that I, and the nice thing is you can download the game right now and can. and play it. Um, and it, it, this is and there's plenty to discuss, I think, more on the design level of where where your your interventions are. So especially after we've, we've played it a bit. Um, our next, and sorry, our final presenter here is uh, Melissa Kagan from Curry College uh, with a presentation called Self-Help and Tabletop Games. Um, let's make sure that, yep, it's on presenter mode and we're all set. Take it away, Melissa. Awesome, thank you so much. Um... Wow, what an incredible, inspiring panel to be on. I am just so inspired by everything I've been hearing at this conference so far. This is my first time here uh, at this conference and I will definitely be back. This is amazing, thank you. Um, okay, uh, I am Melissa. Um, I've got accidentally some animated stuff up here, but here's my contact info. I'd love to keep in touch with anyone who's interested in any of what I'm gonna be talking about. Uh, let me preface this by saying that I have a book coming out on a totally different topic. Um, my Wandering Games book uh, is coming out from MIT in October, uh, and I say this both as an introduction, this is kind of what I've been working on for the last 10 years, but also uh, to say that what I'm talking on today is a really new research area. Um, wandering Games is mostly about wandering in digital environments, does a little board game analysis, and it does trace the connection between live performance and uh, walking simulators, especially, and wandering in digital environments. Um, but for the most part, what I'm talking about today is a phenomenon I've started to pay attention to in the last couple years. Uh, so what is that? Uh, gathering info on and thinking about the overlap between games, uh, digital and analog, and self-help. So I'm juxtaposing on this slide uh, these two games that both came out in 2021. Uh, on the left, we've got Where Should We Begin? A game of stories that was uh, put out by Esther Perel, who is much better known as a podcaster and relationship counselor. Uh, and then on the right, It Takes Two, uh, the um, couch co-op a uh, game about couples therapy uh, that won Game of the Year at the Game Awards, both in 2021. Uh, so, yeah, uh, I played both these games in 2021, uh, and my college, as so many other places, uh, we were thinking a lot more about mental health and um, how everyone was going to try to get through this time as well as possible, how I, as an instructor, could try to help my students get through this time. And I was just thinking a lot more about these issues and seeing this, uh, this phenomenon starting to happen in games. Uh, so the broader research project, this is a slide about the broader research project, uh, is going to be more about self-help and therapy in analog as well as video games. Um, the dawn of psychoanalysis, Freud had a lot to say about the crucial importance of play. You know, this is certainly uh, not <laughs> anywhere near the first project on this. There's a lot, especially on mental health and games. Uh, there was the psychotherapy chatbot Eliza in the in 1960s, so Joseph Weizenbaum in 1966, who kicked off the video game era with Peggy Promise 
of digital therapy and therapeutic gaming. If you're not familiar, up on the left, uh, you write to Eliza and she writes back in the guise of a therapist. It's mostly just, well, it, it is playing with language. She's not a good therapist, but still she feels sort of like a therapist. Uh, over in the center, we've got Eliza from 2019, a visual novel developed by Zach Tronics, where uh, we live in a fictionalized world in which uh, Eliza Chatbot has become uh, a tech company. Super interesting game. Uh, on the right, there's kind of an anonymous human version of Eliza called Kind Words, developed by Pop Cannibal in 2019, where you write anonymous letters about your problems and then strangers write back and give advice to other people's letters. It's a very cozy, pleasant space. Uh, here on the bottom left, there are tons of self-help apps, Happify, MoodFit, Mood Mission, Calm, a million others. Uh, there are human therapists who give video-based therapy online, like BetterHelp in the center there. Uh, and then there are also crafting RPGs focused on troubled relationships. I gave uh, this picture from Longtail Games, uh, but I'm also thinking of Shen Yang Core's keepsake game, Amending, about friends trying to find their way back towards one another. Uh, because I'm not just interested here in mental health games writ large, I'm interested in how we try to uh, gamify relationships or relationship satisfaction. Uh, these works that I'm thinking about are sitting on the spectrum between game and tool. Um, so this is an example of uh, how in It Takes Two, this is a self-help book that is um, that I see is related to Hold Me Tight. Uh, anyway, uh, so yeah, so with self-help tabletops, I'm trying to examine how healthy relationships are depicted by and enacted through Esther Perel's Where Should We Begin, A Game of Stories, uh, and Eve Rodsky's Fair Play. Uh, both are therapeutic gamifications of loving relationships designed and marketed as collaborative self-help tools. Uh, and both of them are technically games, uh, but they are both distributed and created uh, by people who are much more in the self-help space rather than in the game space. Uh, I'm really interested in how tabletop gameplay, self-help, and therapy, and the overlap between those things has been expanded and productized. Uh, in both games, players are asked to collaboratively write and revise a story about their relationships, but instead of doing so within the fictional context of a traditional RPG, they are doing so non-fictionally using the narrative structure of a card game. Uh, so Esther Perel is within a constellation, and I picked these other three uh, influencers. I could have picked many others, but Esther Perel is uh, within a group of people who are have these transmedia uh, empires. Uh, so podcasts and TikToks and books and labs and active therapy practices. Uh, and these are people who have built their careers on their ability to coach humans through thorny emotional entanglements. Perel's new game extends her practice into the ludic sphere. Uh, she's got a quote, the pandemic left us missing intimacy and play, so I created a game that helped us do both. Uh, and so we see this influencer, self-help influencer expanding into the game space. Um, and Eve Rodsky, uh, has similarly created both a book and a card game um, to foster discussion and encourage couples to divvy up domestic and invisible labor more equitably. But to what extent are these works really playable, enjoyable, or therapeutic? When we look at these games as games, how do they come across? Uh, so something I want to note here is that these influencers or these parasocial therapists are, you have a parasocial relationship with these influencers as therapists, especially as podcasters. You listen to their practice and you uh, feel as if they are talking to you in some cases or you're instructed by their example. And so I'm lightly theorizing this divide where ideally you might have you and a human therapist, but if you don't have access to that, uh, you might, or for whatever reason, you aren't getting that or don't want that you might either pick some kind of algorithmic therapist like mood mission um, or a parasocial therapy relationship, a, a parasocial therapist who comes to your, uh, or a parasocial therapist, yeah, like Esther Perel. And so we can think of these card games that I'm about to talk about as extensions of 
artificial way for them to come into your home and give you the structure to be your own relationship counselor. Uh, these games are also building on older games, uh, like that from the Gottmans. Uh, the Gottman Institute is home of perhaps the most famous research-based approach to relationships. Uh, and on their website, currently, they offer seven card decks designed to improve relationships with friends, family, romantic partners, or children. They are pitched for different life moments at which a person might find themselves at a crossroads. Uh, so I think the one I picked to picture is 52 questions before marriage or moving in. Uh, there are also 52 questions after 50, 52 questions before baby, etc. Um, each product description explains the concept of that particular deck, followed by some sample questions. And each promise is in bold that it can be used as a regular deck of cards too, and sometimes encourages the player uh, with statements like that at the bottom, don't gamble on love, play with a full card deck together. So I'll come back to this marketing copy. Uh, but it's clear that the products are designed to exist somewhere within the discourse of games, repurposing the formal structure of a game of cards, but to different ends, to the end of developing a better relationship rather than having an enjoyable good time, while capitalizing on that familiar form to make a scary conversation seem lighter in intensity. And the gambling rhetoric here is also turned on its head. Whereas one would step away from a card table in order not to gamble at poker or another card game, one must step towards the card table in order not to gamble at the game of, one relation of one's relationships. Uh, so here I'm gonna turn uh, to where should we begin? A game of stories from Esther Perel. Uh, it is a really odd game uh, because it doesn't really work as a game and it really seems uncomfortable as a form of therapy. It's weirdly threatening. Uh, it's awkward, it doesn't really seem like it would serve well either function, either deepening relationships or fun gameplay. Uh, in the copy, Perel writes, in this game there are no winners or losers, everyone's on the same team, the intention is to come together around the magic of storytelling. Uh, and the mechanic is essentially an apples to apples mechanic. Uh, you can get the storyteller, a role that shifts around the circle, gives a prompt card, uh, that's the blue card there down at the bottom, and then everyone else takes one of the cards that's in their hand and lays it on the blue prompt card. Uh, and then the storyteller picks one of those cards and then uses it to tell that story. Uh, you can also add tokens for advanced play. So if you want to make the storyteller answer a specific card, and I'm quoting here from the, uh, from the card here, uh, the storyteller must answer the card with a token on it. Each token may only be used once, and the storyteller cannot play a token. Uh, which is especially interesting for a game that seems like it's trying to open up an avenue of conversation. Uh, the consent issues here are, are problematic uh, if you're really going to use tokens, and if you were really to take that mechanic seriously, uh, it's like this awkwardly forcible truth or dare without any of the sexiness. Uh, so. Fair play, on the other hand, uh, is not built on an apples to apples mechanic. Uh, and by the way, I want to shout out to uh, Peter, the site, I want to cite <laughs> Peter Wonica's Learning to Evaluate Analog Games for Education in Analog Game Studies from 2015 for uh, their very interesting work on reskinning apples to apples games uh, as some kind of educational game. Um, they write all about how uh, common it is to do that. So. In fair play, it's not an apples to apples game, but rather uh, you are reading this book on the right and then you are using these friends in this, or you are using this, uh, these cards in this fair play deck uh, to build a deck worth of different tasks that you think are important. So this is you and the person you're living with, you're building your tasks, uh, and then you're dealing out the cards so you each have a roughly equitable number. Uh, if you hold the card, you're responsible for ex executing it. Uh, and then finally, you're doing something called claiming your unicorn space, uh, which is whatever, um, your unicorn space is basically whatever makes you feel like yourself. Uh, so this is much more on the order of tool than game, right? This is a way to try to allocate housework tasks uh, in a home such that they are roughly fair. Uh, and in the book, 
I was struck by something uh, in response to the question that I started asking at the beginning of this project. How does the relatable performance of what it is to be a good human, a talent at which Perel, Rodsky, and all parasocial therapists must excel, how does that relate to the creation and performance of a good tabletop character uh, in a role playing game? Uh, and on page 96 of Radsky's Fair Play, she writes, after having children, many of us feel that we're no longer seen or no longer see ourselves for the vibrant individuals we are. Instead, we take on the corresponding identity for the various roles we now play, spouse, caretaker, parent, household manager, list maker. Consider what you were once known for among friends and loved ones and how often you identify yourself with that special something now. Uh, right, so I think my point so far uh, in this project, again, new project, we'll see where it goes, but these games are an extension of your parasocial relationship counselor. Uh, they're Esther Perel or Eve Brodsky coming into your home and giving you the structure to be your own relationship counselor. And the role they invite you to play is a fuller version of yourself. Uh, a unicorn version of yourself. If we map this onto a fantasy themed RPG, the fantasy becomes be more fun. Uh, if you play this game, you can be you, but funner and fuller uh, and not just a spouse, caretaker, parent, etc. cetera. Uh, and it's doing so using the language of games to make it fun, uh, oftentimes to make something unpleasant uh, feel fun. Uh, and that's my time. Thank you so much. Thank you, Melissa. And again, thanks to all four presenters for remaining fastidiously on time to give us exactly a half an hour for discussion. That's that's really just a luxury. Um, let's pull up our view and then get all, if all four uh, panelists could assemble in whatever way that looks, then we'll, we'll, we'll start there. Um, I guess one one thing that comes from the final uh, uh, panel is the uh, phrase weirdly threatening, which I think uh, can run through a lot of different uh, both erotic and non erotic games. And and so I, I really do want to meditate on 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 uh, where, where since since sex and play are so closely aligned, why then do the games as intermediaries of those things become weirdly threatening? And 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 then and then I think another uh, thread coming up from that talk in particular is the gamification of relationships, and and how do we mechanize relationships? So uh, thinking thinking that sexuality is just a relation rather than just that than than something uh, privileged and special, but that then uh, it gets into all these weird uh, power dynamics, especially when you get into say the fantasy realism that. Um, that P.S. Burgi uh, brought in 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 to question or the erotic games, um, in 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 uh, Cat's talk. So, I I want to say uh, relationships. Um, where <laughs> where and how do do games build uh, relationships, especially the, the and and focusing I think specifically on yours and of course Finley. Um, it's a solo game, but that doesn't mean you're not building a relationship. I, I think we can even start there, right? What what is uh, what is the relationship lurking within um, solo journaling games or even your game? Um, I think with relationships, it's. I mean, I said my game's about conversations, but who's to say? But how many conversations it takes to be friends with someone, right? Like. And I let the player decide that. Like there are certain like key characters, I say, there's, a, there's only a few selection of characters per location. You're gonna talk to the same person more than once eventually, um, <laughs> you know, and it's up to the player to decide how much relationship they decide to draw out. Like however long you decide to play this game for, you can decide where your relationship goes. And I think it's obviously usually a two way street and that's where you get into role playing, I guess, two parts of a conversation there. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think it's like, there's no real numerical value. I think it's depending on how you feel about it, which is, uh, again, it's all very feelings. 
Uh, and I think, uh, uh, P.S., the, the the disclaimer you gave at the beginning of your talk is the counter talk to your talk, where where on the you know on the one hand, uh, this this uh, game is so broken that it kind of needs to be burnt to the ground. And uh, I also like to remind people that in the two thousands, D and D was an embarrassment. It was it was not the hip game that is now marketed to us, at, you know, in this aggressively corporate way. It was it was considered to be one of the worst designed games, but you know, sort of the one that people still played, I guess. And 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 it, it's gotten a facelift to some degree, right? And 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 it, it has transitioned in its own way into this 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 current uh, moment. But I think, again, your disclaimer is like, well, there are lots of trans people who are using this game to build relationships, to build their own polycule in, you know, their, their, um, <laughs> in, in, in their fantasy world and other things. I mean, I'm just being real here. This is, yeah. this is what, what people use the <laughs> game for. And, and um, you know, where, where do we go there i mean i mean in in terms of you know not only validating but also even studying that sort of relation built through dungeons and dragons yeah wow, wow wow no that's a that's a big question and and that is very real yes i mean queer and trans people use uh D, D to build their networks and build their polycules and it both senses of the term i thinking about this for me i i, I think what this comes back to is is kind of two things. Um, like the relationships that you build at the table are like very real and for queer and trans people, like that's always the most important thing is like the gathering, right? Um, and I actually, I had an opportunity to, to talk to an undergraduate researcher earlier this week who was asking about um, experiences of coming out through tabletop role play. Um, and one of the things that I mentioned was um, I came out actually because I was put at a table with queer players playing D&D, &D, right? Um, and so like, here is my experience encountering this very hegemonic game um but building those relationships that like enabled like a safety network for like my own like coming out um but yes in the time uh since this i have and the the gifts in the chat are giving me life um become a little bit of like a ludo arsonist in the sense that like i i do sort of believe like there's an important role for like interrogating the larger structures there and the problem that i see to bring it back to relationships, is that games like D&D have come to salute the game before relationships, right? It is game before it is people. It is me telling you how you should be playing, whether that's, you know, hegemonic structures behind build guides, whether that's um, biological determinism, whether that's just aggressive grognards. Like, when when that happens, that's, that's the whole issue, right? <clears throat> And, and and to then turn to Kat's talk, okay, so the uh, Honey and Hot Wax is supposed to be sort of addressing that. We're actually, the, the, the people are supposed to be beyond the games. You get to pick which game you're going to do, and they will they will be at varying levels of, of calibration. Uh, where, where do we, um, in, in what ways do we build knowledge of other players to, to, to build, get a relationship? Why, I mean, because I, I do know there are some games in that collection that are just like, you're going to build up to sex in this very specific way, and then you're actually going to have sex, and that's going to be part of the game. And then there are other games that, you know, again, are rubbing balloons, and that's that um, in, in an erotic way. So there's this really vast scale, but you're still always, again, building a relationship with at least one other human being. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think that what is what is really interesting about relationships and honey and hot wax um, is that, you know, in, in many ways, all of the games are about exploring some kind of relationship, right? Whether it be a group of friends talking about um, their knowledge about sex, whether it be um, people negotiating sort of their BDSM desires and trying to find someone that matches theirs. Um, uh, Sharon's game in the collection is sort of about the failure of communication around sex and desire and attraction um, and, and sort of what that does to a relationship. But it's also about the relationships that the players have to each other. And one of the things that I find really interesting in some of the reviews that I've read is, you know, people being like, um, this game collection is really interesting, but I don't have the kind of relationship with my GM 
or my fellow players that we could play a game about exploring each other's naked bodies. Um, and so it, it sort of sets up this like, you know, what are the limitations of the player relationships that enable or do not enable uh, this kind of play to take place. And, and, and finally, moving back to Melissa's talk, especially uh, in light of several other panels that have been sort of articulating the neoliberal hell that we find found ourselves in in terms of platforms and, and others. And, and it seems like these self-help games, especially because It Takes Two was marketed to me as like the coziest possible game. And now I, I now I'm having second thoughts about it. I've only I've only watched play playthroughs. I haven't actually played it myself. So I just you know I I think uh, this there there there's there's something weird and dangerous here uh, in in the kind of relationships that that these games are are trying to have you build. But maybe it's maybe that's just the, you know the nature of the beast. I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> uh, the neoliberal hell. Yeah. Um... I mean, I thought It Takes Two was pretty cozy. Uh, it also, uh, you know, was a game about two people who really shouldn't be, I think someone was saying on the Discord too, like, you know, really is about people who really should get divorced and it really felt uncomfortable to be getting them back together. Uh, and I could kind of, I could see that mapping onto like a whole lot of other kinds of games where it's like you can start off with tension, but like by the end, it really has to resolve into like heterosexual marriage script happiness and we're gonna have, uh, you know, a happy ending no matter what. Um, I mean, I definitely, you know, something like Fair Play, like it's trying so hard to individualize systemic problems. Um, all you have to do is take this stack of cards that's, you know, this thick, and then you go through it with your partner and you decide which one is important to you as a family. And every single card, you're looking like, yeah, that seems important. Like, actually, all of those things seem important. And then you divvy them up, and it's like, as if through playing a game, you could somehow make there be more hours in the day. You could make the two of you not both have full-time jobs. You, you could solve the, you know, fundamental like who's gonna do second shifting a problem um but since it's all done in this like very kind of energetic peppy language of play it makes it feel as if not only could you solve it but it could also be fun so you know i haven't actually like played this game i don't know what the result of it would be people do rave about how it has helped them have the conversations that they need in order to make that happen but i think it could just as easily result in um you know, another, yet another kind of failure, yet another, like, I mean, and the book is very much written to the wife of the couple, uh, of the heterosexual couple. Um, it's for the beleaguered woman who is uh, too busy with second shifting. Um, so, yeah. I, I, I'm, um, well, I, 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 don't, I don't want to derail things too much, but I think there's, um, there, there, there's there's something to be said about uh, about a lot of these games being conversation pieces more than things that you actually play, which I think is fine. It, one one critique that's been leveled against the lyric games movement on itch.io in particular is that these games, quote unquote, seem to like they're doing therapy for the author. And I think, well, I think that's much better than than them trying to do the opposite, which which is again where the where where the game designer presumes they're they're doing therapy on you. In the Q&A box, we've got two different questions. One is specifically for Catherine. Um, uh, Maria Alberto writes, I'm intrigued by the way that drive through RPG page for Honey and Hot Wax is also highlighting how this collection is also suitable for play during COVID-19, either remote play or those quarantined together. Just wondering, uh, will that angle play a part in your proposed project as well? Uh, yeah, so I think, you know, one of the things that is so interesting to me about um, thinking about particularly erotic role-playing games um, and analog um, is the sort of embodiment aspect and the fact that so many of the Honey and Hot Wax games actually ask you to um, interact with the bodies of other players and your own body in ways that um, touch, you know, 
touch, haha, brush up against sort of the taboos around touch. Um, so on one hand, it's like, how do you translate that into virtual play, um, which is really interesting. And then I think to get back to my earlier uh, issue of, of relationships is this idea that if you're quarantining with someone, um, you ostensibly have a much more intimate relationship with them. Um, and so could hopefully play these more intimate games with them um, because you, you know, you have this kind of connection um, that you might not have with the people that you um, play role-playing games with at the game store every week or every month, right? Um, so I think it won't be like a focus, um, but definitely how that sort of comes up and how that um, shapes the way that they're talking about these games and playing these games um, will be part of the research. Yeah, and, and a topic that's come up over and over again in these past two days has been the space in which you play shapes the play. And, and so there's an imagined space already for the Honey and Hot Wax collection, as for the Lagoon games, late night games, uh, which which is even prescripted there. Like you're very, you know, if if you're not in that place, you think, well, where are all my sex friends? Um, okay. Um, the 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 question from Leonid Moise Moise's, I will paraphrase. It's for Cat, but also for others, which is to say. Um, why do you think the book of erotic fantasy basically makes little, little mention of romance and, for example, romantic conflicts? So basically, you have relationships on the other hand, sexuality on the other, and romance is sort of somewhere in between. And, and what about romance in games? Um, is it, why is this topic, which looks important and appropriate for the fantasy genre milieu, which often handles it poorly, but comes back to it again and again, is forgotten? romance i'm happy to let other folks answer okay, yeah, that, 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 i just i mean i just I, answered a question that's true um where uh is where is romance in um D, &D for example i mean okay if if we want to have that I mean that's a that's a much larger conversation but but um one of the 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 problems with like situating things like sex and romance um within D D's logics is that it's still inheriting fantasy realist logics from established fantasy media which is why when you read like um Gary Allen Fine's shared fantasy for example um rape was a common thing at tables where um in his ethnographic study of like early war gaming and early D, &D. um and i mean uh let's see this is still being recorded i'm going to be careful what i say here uh i think another really pertinent example of this though is the efforts of like queer designers to bring um queer and trans and gay relationships and dynamics to games like D&D. Um, Oliver Darkshire in particular created a book of um, queer villains that was called Queer Coded. And it was a bunch of monsters that you could like, you know, fight and kind of romance. But um, that received a lot of backlash online because as people pointed out, you're creating gay villains for D&D. There's there's not a lot of ways that this can go down, right? Like these are effectively just serving up queer bodies to be slaughtered within the logical structures of this game. So um, I'm gonna pass it off to someone else smarter than me, but okay, you okay. get the idea. Uh, that's all good. Um, let's see here. I, I we got, and again, if, if no one is feeling the romance, then we can we can move on because I have a question from Jennifer Hartshorn. Um, uh, Jennifer Hartshorn says, says uh, for what it's worth, I'd like to direct people to Love Beyond Death, which was the romance-based supplement for Wraith the Oblivion. Full disclosure, I was the developer. It also includes Queer Romance in 1995, which was unusual for that time. And Jennifer and I have had conversations specifically about this, the, where the um, uh, White Wolf developers um, were, were very much on, on the cutting edge of, of, of queer representation um, in the 1990s, uh, when when that was considered to be uh, poisonous by other publishers, or they or they would they would do workarounds that were not particularly nice. Um, so 
I guess this 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 brings up a, a larger question of queer representation in in analog gaming, and that um, that Jakob Stenros and Tanya Sivonen's research also published in Analog Game Studies more or less demonstrates that that uh, uh, we've always been there from the beginning. That the queer folk have always been have they, 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 there's that there's never so we should we should always destroy this idea of of, of there are all these queer folk moving into tabletop gaming when they they were playing it from from the mid 70s on and they were represented in in these games from the mid 70s on but with very wildly um different <laughs> modes there and and as um as pointed out by by ps but also also in finley's presentation uh these then get coded almost immediately as monstrous or or um or other um representations so at this point um melissa you're on cool i just wanted to i'm thinking through that um and also thinking through the romance question that kind of threw me a bit but i realized that um especially where should we begin uh reminds me of um did anyone see the the 30s i just looked it up the 36 questions that lead to love in the new york times it was like a big thing a couple i don't know maybe 10 years ago um and it's really just you know date questions that you could ask but the idea is that if you go through them in a certain order it makes a certain promise about you know you start off with the casual questions then you go deeper and deeper and deeper and at the end of it you're supposedly in love um so i guess where should we begin and these the kind of games that i was talking about are trying to do the same sort of thing as if there could be a set of questions that you could discuss in the right order that would lead to greater intimacy and even romance um no no comment on whether that's effective in any way uh, or maybe you know it is effective for some people but not others what have you yeah, and then it's also again that question of, of whose fantasy is this this particular set of questions uh, <laughs> I, I again I I think you uh if any panelists have questions for each other this is also a, another time where I'd, I'd love to, to to see if you, if you have any questions um, for each other Otherwise, we can just say this is this. Oh wait, well there it is. There's. I, I was like, where? Where is the the the, the hand? Okay. Sorry, I. <laughs> it's all good. The sun is coming in my window, so I like can't see my own computer screen. Yeah. So I was like, I can't hit the actual hand. Okay. Um, I I have a question uh for Finley, um, which hopefully is not going to put you on the spot too much, but I'm really interested. Um, as as an older queer who is has a lot of resonance with um the gothic monsters um but also i uh i just mentored a student last semester who wrote um a visual novel called cryptid coffee house um which is totally about using cryptids as a queer metaphor so i think that's super super fascinating to me um and i was wondering if you had any thoughts about like what those shifting metaphors might say um, about sort of uh, queer identity or queer games or like queer art. Because uh, I just, I think that that's really, really interesting. Yeah, for sure. I think obviously the first shift, right, comes from, obviously the Gothic monster comes from literature. It was already fantastical from the get-go. We immerse ourselves into the world of the book, whereas cryptids have immersed themselves into our world we're the ones that have perceived cryptid supposedly you know <laughs> like people have spotted various creatures and have claimed made these claims so i think that's where the first shift has gotten to it's almost like people have come around to seeing us queer people you know <laughs> like that's where the first shift comes from as opposed to we are being introduced to it like that's the first like real reversal there um and it's place in like kind of queer art. I mean, again, it's it's for me reclaiming it. It's for me putting myself forward as a queer person and saying, I'm here, I'm your problem now. 
<laughs> um, as opposed to being posited in such a way where you are introduced as the monstrous. You're introducing yourself and whether or not you're seen as that, that's up to the other person. <laughs> you're just positing yourself as who you are. Right. If there are no further questions here, there is indeed a lot of love in the room. So we'll show our presenters uh, one more round of, of appreciation for their their work, and um, you know we'll we'll see you in the Discord, and otherwise we'll see you in um, half an hour or actually thirty five minutes uh, for the final moderated panel of the day before we then get to our keynote um uh later on but the final moderated panel of the day and also of the conference is is uh intersectionality and tabletop games moderated by our own ed chang and 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 izzy williams and we are uh looking forward to those those presentations so for those who are continuing on please stop by in 35 minutes thank you so much everybody and i appreciate all that you've done